In the first video of this series, I talked about the foundation of the Order of the Garter by Edward III in the 1340s. Remarkably, the design of the robes and insignia of the Knights of the Order can be traced right back to that time, although they have, of course, developed and been added to over the centuries. The robes worn by a knight consist of the garter itself, which is worn around the left leg under the knee. Over the shoulders is then placed a cloak called a mantle of dark blue velvet, to which a red hood is attached. Over the mantle, since the late 15th century, has been worn a collar tied to it with white silk ribbon, from which is suspended a badge or pendant called the Great George. On a knight's head, since the time of Henry VIII, has been worn a velvet hat with ostrich feathers. Since the late 16th century, on occasions when the formality of these full robes and insignia were not appropriate or were impractical, knights have tended to wear a blue ribbon or sash, from which is suspended a second pendant that is called by the 18th century the Lesser George. Since 1627, a star has also been worn, pinned or sewn to clothing, when this Lesser George is used. The mantle, the garter and the hood are the earliest elements of the insignia and were worn from the very beginning of the order. There is a wonderful early 15th century manuscript called the Garter Book of William Bruges. Bruges was the first garter principal king of arms, the herald of the order. He was appointed to that office in 1415 by Henry V and he held it until he died in 1450. His garter book was his own account of the order's history and foundation and it includes full-page images of the original knights of Edward III's foundation, and they are shown wearing robes as worn in the early 15th century. This particular drawing from the book shows the elves of Warwick and Stafford in their garter robes. Their blue mantles are lined with white and are worn here over their armour and their own heraldic surcoats. On their left shoulder, the mantle is decorated with a badge of the order, the red cross on the white background, the arms of St George, encircled with the garter itself, emblazoned with its motto, Honi Sui Queen Malipons. Such a badge can still be seen on modern garter mantles. The colour and material of the garter mantle has altered over the years. In the 14th century, the mantles were seemingly made of dark blue wool, and in the 15th century, the wool gave way to silk velvet. In the 17th century, the silk velvet was rather more purple in hue than blue. And in the late 17th and 18th centuries, the colour varied from celestial blue, pale blue, to royal blue. In the early 20th century, the colour returned to the dark blue that we're familiar with today. Here is Sir Robert Harley, the first Earl of Oxford, in his robes. Notice the lighter colour of his mantle compared to the colour of modern garter robes. Notice also in the Bruges garter book how the two knights are wearing a curious red headgear, a round cap with a flap at the back coming down to the neck. This is the hood of the order. And notice that the Earl of Warwick's hood is decorated with a powdering of gold embroidered garters. It seems that the Garter Knights stopped wearing this hood on their heads in the early 16th century when the present ostrich feather plumed hat replaced it, but it continued to be part of the specified robes of the order and was carried, draped over the shoulder. It is still part of the official robes today, in a vestigial form, and is attached to the mantle as a permanent adornment. That's what the curious little red thing is, on the right shoulder of the late Queen. This unworn hood seems to have moved around a bit. Sometimes it was attached to the back, sometimes to the shoulder, moving further forward and getting smaller as time passed. It is now not wearable at all, as it has shrunk in size. Notice the tiny ring of fabric. That is the shrunken form of the top of the hood's cap. The hood also has a long strip of fabric attached to it at the back that was once part of it. This is called the Liri Pipe and was a usual element of hoods in the 14th century. The Liri Pipe now hangs down at the front of the mantle and was in times past tucked into the belt at the waist to secure it by garter knights. The earliest surviving garter 
is in the collection of Lord Fairhaven at Anglesey Abbey in Cambridgeshire and was allegedly the garter given to the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian in 1489 by Henry VII. The buckle and shape of this garter are from 1489 but sadly the fabric part is an 18th century copy of the original. It is believed to be a faithful replica and gives us an indication of the late medieval form of the garter. The motto's words are interspersed with Tudor, red and white roses. The garter's decoration has taken many forms over the years. The garters of the royal family in the 18th and early 19th century, rather than being embroidered in gold, were often studded with diamonds. This is the garter made for Prince Albert in 1840. Even the letters of the motto are outlined in diamonds. Before I move on, we should look quickly at a couple of the robes that have now fallen out of use. The statutes of the order from the reign of Henry VIII include a garment called a surcoat of crimson velvet as part of the robes. Apparently such surcoats were worn from the very foundation of the order. The crimson surcoat resembled the crimson and purple surcoats Charles III wore at his coronation under his robes. You can see the Knights of the Garter wearing their red surcoats in this illumination showing Henry VIII with his knights from the Risley Garter book. The surcoat was still worn in the early 19th century and you can see it in many paintings of Garter Knights from the 18th century. The last time it was worn was seemingly in 1911 by the future Edward VIII at his installation as a Garter Knight and it has not been worn since. Below the surcoat from 1661 was one something called the under habit, consisting of a cloth of silver doublet and hose. This continued to be worn until the early years of the 20th century. Its last outing was in fact at the coronation of Elizabeth II in 1953, where it was worn by the garter knights who held the canopy at the Queen's anointing. Today, the garter knights wear their mantles directly over their ordinary dress. The gold collar of the Order of the Garter wasn't introduced until the final decade of the 15th century, or perhaps even in the early years of the 16th century. King Henry VII had been elected in 1491 as a Knight of the Order of the Golden Fleece, and he often wore the collar and pendant of that order. He is seen wearing it in the famous contemporary portrait of him. It seems that he may well have introduced the collar of the garter in emulation of the collar of the fleece. The earliest known representation of the collar is on a monument to a knight of the order, Sir Robert Willoughby, Lord Willoughby de Brooke, at Callington in Cornwall. He died in 1502 and his effigy is of the same year and the collar can be seen on it. The collar of gold is a chain that consists of different elements. The principal elements are 24 badges, one for each knight companion of the order. These are in the form of a stylized rose encircled with a garter and with the garter motto. These are enameled in red, green and blue as appropriate. These are linked together with 24 stylized lover's knots, a motif popular in the Tudor period, and they refer in this context to the ties that bind in loyalty the Garter Knights, to their sovereign, and to one another. In Henry VIII's 1544 statutes of the order, the roses on the garter collar were to be Tudor roses. And the earliest collars depicted are seen here on these portraits of Henry VIII's Chief Minister Thomas Cromwell and Elizabeth I's Chief Minister Lord Burley, um, show the roses as double Tudor roses, a red rose with inner petals of white that represent the union of the royal houses of Lancaster and York through the marriage of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. All the present garter collars have red roses. When this change was made is unclear. The earliest physical garter collars to survive date from the early 17th century. One of them was given to Christian IV, King of Sweden, by James I in 1603, and the other was bestowed in 1628 on the Earl of Northampton, and at this stage the roses are then wholly red. There is one exception to this rule in, in, in the modern age, and that is the collar made for and worn by Queen Victoria in 1837. It gave a nod to the Tudor style and has alternating white roses with red inner petals and red roses with white inner petals. Since the collar's introduction, suspended from it has been a pendant jewel that is now called the Great George. 
It depicts the moment when St George, in full armour on horseback, attacks the dragon as he rescues the princess. Again, the way this is depicted has varied. Some of the earlier Georges, as seen in these portraits of King Edward VI and Lord Burley, have the saint's image set within a representation of the garter itself. In all the extant Georges, even the earliest, the encircling garter is omitted. There are other differences too. In all the earliest depictions of the great George, and the earliest examples to survive from the early 17th century, the saint is shown drawing his sword to attack the dragon. From the reign of Charles II onwards, the saint is shown, as in the hagiography, spearing the dragon with a lance. Usually the great George is coloured with enamel, and sometimes even set with gems. As you will see in the next video, many of the later Georges worn by the royal family are encrusted with stones and diamonds. These collars must have been unwieldy to wear regularly, and it appears that sometime in the reign of Elizabeth I, an alternative, more informal form of the garter insignia seems to have developed, one that the Queen herself wore. The Great George was either removed or a second George made that was worn suspended around the neck on a blue silk ribbon by Garter Knights. Here is Queen Elizabeth I wearing such a George on a broad ribbon and here is her secretary Robert Cecil in his portrait at Hatfield House wearing the same. In later years, a second badge was always provided for this use and suspended by a light blue ribbon, a different colour than the mantle, it became known as the Lesser George. The early Stuart monarchs seemed to favour the use of the ribbon and Lesser George and the collar fell out of use for general court wear, being confined only to collar wearing days stipulated by the Order's statutes. King Charles I appears to have worn the Lesser George as part of his daily wear. In his famous triple portrait by Van Dyck, he is shown wearing the Lesser George on a broad, light blue ribbon around his neck. He didn't always wear it that way. When out and about or on horseback, he seems to have favoured wearing the ribbon as a sash over his left shoulder and tied at the waist. Perhaps it was more practical to do so when on horseback. After the restoration of the monarchy, wearing the ribbon and Lesser George this way became the usual mode. He was the second Duke of Devonshire in the early 18th century and he can be seen wearing the Lesser George in this configuration. By this stage, the ribbon had been rather tidied up. The rather wide and thickly gathered material of the past was replaced by a neat sash of kingfisher blue silk tied at the waist by a bow. The Lesser George of today is simply an adornment for the sash rather than being, as it was in the early 17th century, a badge suspended from a ribbon. Notice in the portrait of the second Duke of Devonshire that as well as the Lesser George and the Sash, the Duke is also wearing a star of the Order of the Garter. The Garter star was something that Charles I introduced in 1627. He ordered that it was to be worn by Knights of the Garter upon the left part of their cloaks, coats and riding cassocks, at all times when they shall not wear their robes, and in all places and assemblies, a testimony to the world of the honour they hold, the order instituted and ordained for persons of the highest honour and greatest worth. At the centre of the star is the badge found on the order's mantle. The rays around it represent glory, the preeminent glory, prestige and honour of this ancient order. Charles I had the star embroidered in all his cloaks. He wore it and the Lesser George on a ribbon at his trial prior to his execution. Fashion changed after the restoration of the monarchy and from thereafter the garter star was often embroidered on the ordinary clothing of a knight. The wedding suit of James Duke of York, later James II, from his marriage to Mary of Modena in 1673 survives in the V&A in London and he has had the garter embroidered on the coat on his left breast. At some point, perhaps in Charles I's reign, the badge of the order on the sovereign's mantle was replaced instead with a representation of the Garter Star. Now, Charles III, at his first Garter Day last June, seems to have worn his previous mantle, so will we see this tradition of a distinctive sovereign's mantle dropped? I do hope not. Often, from the 18th century onwards, the Garter Star was a badge made of metal, 
And as I will show you in the next video, it was also at times studded with stones and was a spectacular ornament to the wearer. Thanks for watching. I still have a few copies of the December issue of The Antiquary available. When it arrived from the printer, Claire, my wife, said it looked like a 28-page Christmas card. It is very colourful this time and full of Christmas-related goodies. There are articles and images of the nativity and art, Christmas through the diary entries of a Georgian parson, and the history of punch. The robust historical version of the insipid modern mulled wine. I even give you a recipe for it. If you enjoy learning about Christmas through the ages, do pick up a copy from the website, but be quick as they seem to be flying off the shelves. Subscribers, your copies have already been sent out and will, if Royal Mail is behaving itself, be with you before Christmas. Mm -hmm.